हरि ओम वेलकम टू योग विद्या गुरुकुल योगा पॉइंट योगा थेरेपी ट्रेनिंग प्रोग्राम वी विल बी टॉकिंग अबाउट नर्वस सिस्टम ऑर्डर टू बिगिन विथ लेट इज ट्राई टू अंडरस्टैंड द स्ट्रक्चर ऑफ अ न्यूरॉन or a nerve cell now typically a neuron or a nerve cell consists of a cellular body and its extensions as dendrites which are multiple in number and a single axon so the cell body consists of the nucleus the main part of the neuron and for conduction of impulses for conduction of nerve impulses there are dendrites multiple of them and axon now this axon they are covered with a fatty tissue which is called as the myelin sheath it's an insulating sheath covering the long axons the nerve cells and at the terminals of the axon there are synaptic knobs or in simple words there are structures which can connect with other neuron other nerve cell to form a continuation this is a structure of a synapse or we can say that synapse is a point where one nerve cell connects with the other nerve cell so that the impulses the nerve impulses can be transmitted from one cell to another cell so actually the axons they connect with the dendrites of the other cell forming a synapse the part which is before the synapse is called as presynaptic and the part which is after the synapse is called as postsynaptic so we will be having a presynaptic cell and a postsynaptic cell the impulses they are always carried into one single direction so from the first cell to the axon the impulses will be transmitted to the second cell through the synapse one more important thing to be noted in the brain is about the gray matter and the white matter now usually the gray matter is peripherally located in the brain and usually the white matter is towards the center now the gray matter of the brain is actually the organized structure of the nuclei or the organized structure of the nerve cell body and the white matter is the organized structure of the axons so the extensions of the cells the axons they form the white matter of the brain and the cell bodies they form the 
gray matter of the brain. Now, let us talk about some neurological diseases. The diseases which are related with the brain and the nerves. Some of the important disorders, they are number one, multiple sclerosis, in short, MS. Number two, Parkinson's disease. Number three, Alzheimer's disease. And number four, paralysis. First, let us talk about multiple sclerosis. Now, this disease is actually a degeneration of the nerve and it's a chronic inflammation of the nerves. The disease occurs because of a condition which is called as demyelination of the nerve cells. Or in short, the myelin covering, the fatty tissue covering over the axions is damaged or is inflamed. So because of this, the nerve cells, they are affected and it leads to consequences which can be physical, emotional or even cognitive. So basically, it's important to note that it's a degeneration, it's an inflammation of the myelin sheath covering the nerves. Multiple means many and sclerosis means scars. So we can say in short that it is multiple scarring of the nerve tissue. Multiple sclerosis is considered as the autoimmune disease and the most commonest autoimmune disease of the nervous system. This condition can start anytime between the age group of around 20 years to even 50 years. But it's more commonly observed in women. As it's an autoimmune disease, the abnormal immune system of our body attacks the nerve coverings, the myelin sheets, and it damages the myelin sheets, which actually causes disturbance in sending the nerve impulses. So the signaling mechanism, the nerve impulses, is disturbed because of loss of the insulating covering over the nerves. And because of this disturbance, there can be motor or sensory dysfunction of our body. The signals which are received by the brain or the orders which are sent by the brain can be disturbed because of this chronic inflammatory condition of the nerve coverings. So ultimately, it can lead to disabilities because of the improper conduction of the nerve impulses. To understand multiple sclerosis, would be clear with this picture. So the first part it shows intact myelin sheath or the intact insulating cover over the nerves. And the second part it shows the damaged 
myelin sheath which actually exposes the nerve fiber so it is a nerve which is affected by multiple sclerosis and as the nerve fiber is exposed the conduction of the nerve signals the conduction of the nerve impulses will be disturbed so what are the symptoms of ms multiple sclerosis the symptoms can be many it can be fatigue it can be chronic pain or some abnormal sensation like burning tingling tickling then as the motor signaling mechanism and even the sensory signaling mechanism is disturbed there can be walking disabilities ataxia improper walking or it can even lead to muscular paralysis and weaknesses there can be trouble in speaking there can be problems for sensory reception of various stimuli from the environment the mobility is hampered and in later stages it can even lead to dysfunction of the bowel or even loss of control over the bladder so depending on the part of the nervous system involved depending on the nerves which are involved in this chronic inflammation the symptoms would be different but ultimately it would lead to disabilities and will cause dependency and also loss of control over the bowel and bladder moving on to next disorder of the nervous system is parkinson's disease now this condition is also a degenerative disease but it mainly affects the motor functions the exact cause is not known why this disease occurs or what are the risk factors for this disease but there is some involvement of genetic factors or environmental factors but whatever factors are involved the effect the result is cell death in the basal ganglia the substantia nigra the part of the brain which produces dopamine now this dopamine is actually a neurotransmitter which helps to control our body movements so because of the cell death in the basal ganglia the secretion of dopamine is reduced and the deficiency of dopamine is the primary factor which causes the symptoms of this disease and as this dopamine the neurotransmitter helps in controlling the body movements the symptoms which are related with parkinson's disease they are usually related with the movements of our body the most commonest presenting symptom is tremors of the hand and finger 
when the person is sitting calm and quiet at rest. And these tremors, they are usually called as pill rolling movements. The face also can become expressionless, which is called as a mask face. All the body movements, they become rigid and slow. There is stiffness of muscles. Uncontrolled, unstable walking. There can be even difficulty in breathing, difficulty in respiration. And also, because of the stiffness, because of the motor nerve involvements, there is inadequate evacuation of the bowel and bladder. So basically, we can say stiffness, rigidity, tremors, and slowness of movements with uncontrolled walking are the important presenting symptoms of Parkinson's disease. In severe conditions, in severe form of Parkinson's disease, it can also develop behavioral problems, irritability and depression. And sometimes Parkinson's in severe form can be associated with sleep disorders and dementia. As of now, there is no specific treatment which can completely cure Parkinson's disease, but it can be controlled. In many cases, in many conditions, the functional capacity of the patients can be maintained for several years without any complication. But there is no specific standard way suggested on how to prevent or how to treat Parkinson's so as to maintain the functional capacity. However, it is mentioned that a healthy lifestyle would slow down the degenerative process in the Parkinson's disease. So when it comes to treatment of Parkinson's, what should be our aims when we treat such patient? Important thing is to increase the flexibility, reduce the stiffness, reduce the tightness of the muscles, help improving the posture of that patient and also help for proper coordination, balance and walking. Also, a focus during the treatment can be given on improving the sleep quality and very, very important, helping the patient to breathe easily, making the respiration easy. So, flexibility, coordination, balance. Improving the posture and improving the process of respiration would be the important points when we are treating a patient with Parkinson's disease. Alzheimer's disease. Now, this also is a degenerative disease where there is death of neurons, death 
of the nerve cells and the number of neurons begone becoming lesser and lesser. Possibility is that the brain size also reduces, it also shrinks. This disease is, however, a disease usually of old age, about the years 65 and plus, and it is considered as most commonest form of dementia in the old age. Again, a specific cause of Alzheimer's disease is not known. So it is considered that there can be some genetic factors or environmental factors, or even there can be some problems with the blood circulation, the vascular factor, which is related with the brain or some mention that there can be nerve injuries which fail to heal properly. Improper healing of nerve injuries is considered as one of the factors by some. But then, ultimately we can say that there is no known specific cause for Alzheimer's disease. As far as the symptoms are concerned, the most important, very important symptom is loss of recent memory. So the past memory is intact. Things which have happened long back, memory for that is intact. But there is loss of memory for the recent events. So it is as if the person is going back in the time. Apart from memory loss, there is repetitive speech. Continuously and again and again, the person would speak the same thing or maybe ask the same question. Also the effect can be on forgetting his own language. Because of forgetting the language, there is problem with the speech cannot find proper words. Also may be possibility that there is loss of memory for his own address or maybe daily activities. So forgetting various things which are mostly recent, it will be noticed by the people around Then it's important to note that in this disease, it's more or less related with loss of recent memory, but then the motor function is not affected in Alzheimer's disease. So movements, for example, would not be affected. Walking would not be affected. The motor functions, they are very well maintained, very well intact in Alzheimer's disease. Now, how you can prevent Alzheimer's disease? Because it's a old age disease. So, by changing lifestyle, you can try and prevent this disease. One of the suggestions is being social. Loneliness can cause Alzheimer's. So being social, having friends, talking to them, 
talking to family members is one of the ways of preventing Alzheimer's. Most important is to stimulate your brain by learning something, by keeping the brain active, by exercising your brain. So always try to learn something new. Always try to do something new which is different for your brain which would be like an exercise for your brain and it will help you to prevent Alzheimer's in the future. Paralysis or damaged motor nerves is another condition which is mostly very common. So this damage to the motor nerves is the nerves which are supplying the skeletal muscles. So obviously there is motor impairment which affects the movements of the body parts which are involved. Now these motor nerves they can be the upper motor neuron or the upper motor nerves which are from the brain up to the spinal cord or the spinal ganglia. And another part of the motor nerve is the lower motor neuron which starts from the spinal cord, the spinal ganglion and goes up to the body parts. So when we talk about paralysis, it can be involvement of the upper motor neuron or it can be involvement of the lower motor neuron. So again to understand the difference between the upper motor neuron and the lower motor neuron. In simple words, the part of the nerve which starts from the brain and comes up to the spinal cord is called as the upper motor neuron. And the nerve, the part of the nerve which is from the spinal cord and goes to the skeletal muscles is called as the lower motor neuron. So depending on the part of the nerve involved, it will be called as a condition related with upper motor neuron or the lower motor neuron. Talking about the upper motor neuron. Now basically it's more or less an involvement of the brain damaging the part of the brain and this damage to the part of the brain can be because of stroke, bleeding, the blood vessels, the capillaries especially which are supplying to the brain part may burst open, may rupture open, causing bleeding or it can be infarct, less amount of blood supply to that particular part of the brain or it can be rupture of some aneurysms in the brain circulation. So in any case, if the brain doesn't receive enough blood circulation, proper blood circulation, it can damage the upper motor neuron. And this damage of the upper motor neuron, it can lead to paralysis. 
it can lead to involvement of either one side of the body or it can have the involvement of maybe one leg one arm depending on the area of the brain involved sometimes it can be even limited to the facial muscles facial palsy or it can be limited to aphasia so depending on the part of the brain which is involved depending on the blood circulation which is hampered to the brain the symptoms or the part of the body which is involved would differ but it's important to note here that the upper motor neuron disease if treated promptly the prognosis the outcome can be definitely very good as compared to the lower motor neuron but initiation of the treatment as quickly as early as possible is very very important now what causes this upper motor neuron disease or what causes this improper blood circulation to the brain so of course the risk factors the most important risk factors they are hypertension diabetes and obesity lifestyle factors like smoking and alcohol or consuming large amounts of fatty food oily food increasing the cholesterol levels can be the reasons can be the risk factors for upper motor neuron involvement leading to paralysis and in some cases there can be genetic factors like defective mechanism of blood clotting which can lead to the involvement of the brain damaging the blood circulation of the brain and these all risk factors definitely they are modifiable risk factors or preventable risk factors so upper motor neuron disease is definitely possible to be prevented by modifying the lifestyle so it is important to recognize the conditions as early as possible and initiate the condition as early as possible there may not be any risk factors there may not be any predisposing factors but without any risk factors also the condition can develop so it's always necessary to be alert and keep a watch on slight changes with the motor functions a slight facial drop or a slight drooping of eyelids weakness of some part of the body maybe the arm or the leg extreme fatigue or slurred speech they can be indicative of upper motor neuron disease 
ignes which is progressive can be an indication of upper motor neuron disease so this minor symptoms are not to be neglected and a thorough investigation would be necessary to recognize the disease as early as possible so that the treatment is initiated early and the prognosis is talking about the lower motor neuron disease so basically the part of the nerve which starts from the spinal cord and goes up to the muscles is called as the lower motor neuron so when this part is involved it will affect the respective group of muscles and this form of disease can be very severe the memory the understanding and other functions they are quite intact but then there is involvement of the motor function of the group of muscles which is supplied by the nerve so basically it's a disruption at the level of the spinal cord and the causes for the lower motor neuron disease can be traumatic or it can be some infection viral infection it can be some overgrowth or chronic inflammatory conditions at the level of the spinal cord but as compared to upper motor neuron disease the prognosis for the lower motor neuron disease is a bit bad and the outcome or the cure may not be really satisfactory now we will be talking about management or treatment of various nervous system disorders with the help of yogic practices now when it comes to management of the nervous system disorders a holistic approach is necessary when we initiate yoga therapy so yoga therapy will not only involve yoga postures and pranayam but other aspects of yoga are also to be considered while treating nervous system disorders so it's important to follow the yoga philosophy follow the proper practice of pranayama and asanas focusing on relaxation practice of meditation and awareness simple things in yoga philosophy like the yama and niyama are related with a healthy lifestyle so along with asan pranayam practice even a healthy lifestyle would be essential as a part of yoga therapy and the practice of asan and pranayam should help in deep relaxation and developing the awareness the practice of asan should not be merely 
the practice of various postures. In yoga, the practice of sukshma vyayam, gentle movements, preparatory movements, with deep relaxation, will help to improve the symptoms which are associated with the nerve dysfunction. So it's not about difficult positions, difficult yogasan, but it is about small, simple movements with relaxation and awareness to reduce the symptoms of the nerve dysfunction. Another important thing would be the practice of variations. So taking one position and practicing the variations of that position in a different way would help in improving the balancing, the coordination and the transmission of the impulses to the nerves. So simpler positions of the asanas, simpler positions, variations are definitely important. And while practicing these positions, by stretching the muscles properly, it will help to reduce the stiffness and will increase the flexibility and stability of the nervous system. The yoga postures and the movements which will be crossing the midline of the body will help in balancing and coordinating our nervous system. So the movements where the parts on the left side of our body cross the midline and go to the right side or the parts on the right side of our body cross the midline and go towards the left side would be helpful in coordinating the nervous system, in balancing the nervous system. So a simple thing like shifting your weight from one foot to another would be beneficial. Or hugging yourselves. Or even touching your hand to the opposite side ear or touching your hand to the opposite side knee would also help in improving the coordination between the nerve and the muscle, between the nervous system itself. So simple movements would definitely be recommended. Another important thing with the movements is the rhythm and repetition. So the movements should be slow and they should be rhythmic with awareness. And if this rhythm is also associated with sound, it would be beneficial for the memory. So the practice of mantra chanting involves rhythm, involves sound, involves 
vibration which would be good for improving the memory omkar chanting is rhythmic it is with vibrations and at the same time the rhythm of breathing is involved when we chant om so this repetition and rhythm would be very very essential for improving the functional capacity of the nervous system similarly repetition of the sequence of movements sequence of various yoga postures when repeated again and again would help to increase the neuromuscular coordination then this repetition would be with awareness and with slow gentle and controlled movements also one important fact which yoga would help is to open up the chest and help in improving the breathing pattern improving the breathing rhythm which would be further beneficial some general guidelines for yogic practices the asan practice should always start slowly gently with basic movements and basic asanas and then further slowly improving the practice for people with severe conditions the asan practice can be done in a supine position or a prone position for many days and then focus can be given on the sitting and standing positions so to start with supine and prone position practices can be given more importance more focus more importance should be on relaxation rather than doing multiple practices whenever necessary the yogic practices can be done with support and variations of the postures would be recommended whenever possible whenever necessary it's very important to note that while practicing or while teaching the individual capacity the severity of the disease is to be considered when the person is practicing various yoga postures various yoga practices so what are the specific yogic practices which can be done starting with the simple movements simple movements of the hands the legs knee movements the ankle and toe rotations movements the neck movement and the shoulder movements now these are to be done slowly with awareness and can be repeated few times depending on the part involved 
that movements can be focused more it will help for coordination it will help to reduce the stiffness and increase the flexibility in that particular part simple twisting positions like twisting yourselves thing in vajrasan or twisting the waist kati chakrasan or the stomach movements and the movements like kirki chalanasan the naukasan or the boat movement and the rope climbing movement would be good for the back they would be good for the core muscles and as they are movements they can be repeated to increase the neuromuscular coordination so patients having difficulty in the movements patients who have lost control over various muscular groups can help themselves by practicing these movements and activating the nerves which are supplying those particular group of muscle depending on individual capacity they can be repeated on few occasions simple stretches and balancing postures would be beneficial for nervous system disorders so the positions like mountain pose and tree pose or sideways stretches in standing positions like the tadasan or the tiryak tadasan they will help stretching the muscles and these deep stretches in one direction will help and relax the muscles as these are standing position asanas they would help in improving the balancing they would help in improving the posture of the patients so as these are balancing postures they can be practiced with the support of a chair or with the support of the wall furthermore to improve the blood circulation to improve the muscular strength and to improve the walking and the movement abilities some asanas which would be recommended would be the mountain pose the standing forward bend the warrior pose or even the triangle pose with variations positions like the locust pose the cobra pose or the bridge pose would help in strengthening the core muscles and the back muscles to improve the posture of the patient
and strengthening the core strengthening the back would further help in the overall coordination of the movements of the body movements positions like gomukhasan garudasan namaskarasan or shashankasan they will help in opening up the chest improving the respiration improving the rhythmic movements of the respiration and supplying enough quantities of oxygen because in certain neurological disorders even the breathing is difficult the rhythmic movements of the diaphragm can be achieved by opening up the chest in these particular asana practice for the pranayam practice simple deep breathing would be recommended focusing on breathing in and breathing out trying to achieve a ratio of 1 is to 2 would be recommended the balancing pranayam like the alternate nostril breathing can be practiced very safely it can be practiced with or without holding breath and then the practice of brahmari and the practice of ujjayi would have a soothing effect on the nervous system so in most of the conditions of nervous system disorders this pranayam these breathing techniques can be practiced also walking with focus on breath with breath awareness would be recommended so walking would involve a physical activity and it's also a rhythmic activity along with another rhythmic activity of breathing which would help in the balancing of the nervous system and the neuromuscular coordination so this was in short about some important nervous system disorders and the yogic management of the disorders will stop here hari om